and 63 also, I find Hishman Bracey. You know how I found Hishman Bracey? I looked in the telephone book. <laughs> really? Yeah. I was working at the Jackson Airport one semester trying to make enough money to pay my college tuition after I quit my working job. And I couldn't pay tuition. It was three hundred dollars a semester, so I worked a night job. I'm working with a black man who's having me refuel airplanes. And I just mentioned, by the way, I said, did you ever hear of Tommy Johnson or Ishmael Bracey? Yeah, I know old Bracey. I said, what? I said, yeah, he's a preacher now. I said, matter of fact, he came to our church one time about a year ago. Are you sure? I said, that can't be Bracey. It must be his son. He said, yeah. He said, I think he's in the phone book. I said, what? I go real quick, look up the phone book the next morning. Reverend Ishmael Bracey. So I call his house and say, is this the Reverend Bracey? Yeah, this is Reverend Bracey. Are you the Ishmael Bracey that made records back in about 1929? He paused. Yes, that was me. But I don't play the blues anymore. He said, I work for God now. I was working for the devil then. I said, yes, sir. I said, could I come over and talk to you tomorrow night? He said, yeah, he will not talk to you. I go over to this house. He's renting a room in this house. I knock on the door, the lady comes to the door, she said, by the way, this is the same time that Medgar Evers had just been killed, murdered in Jackson. And it was hot. I mean, it was civil rights days. It was tense. Here I am, a young white man, going to you know, in the black neighborhood, knocking on the door. And she says, uh, well, what do you want? I said, well, uh, Robert Bracey told me I could come see him tonight. So I go in, and there he is, and he comes to the door and walks me in. There's his wife. And I, I carried a copy of Saturday Blues by him on Victor. I said, yes, sir. I said, is this the record you made? He said, he looked at it, hesitated. That's my record. He looked over at his wife, and she just sat there like, hmm. She didn't want him involved with the blues again? No, no. She didn't want him to be, you know. And I said, I'm talking a little bit. He said, yes, sir. I, I made those records. He said, but I'm living for the Lord now. He said, uh, I'm a preacher now. I said, I'm a good preacher now. He said, you know, over a period of time, he said, I've done everything that you can do for the devil wrong. He said, I've changed my ways now. And uh, I said, and I got him to tell me, I asked about Tommy. He said, yeah, me and Tommy was best friends for a while. We had a fallen out. We recorded together. I said, you did? He said, yeah, we recorded together in Memphis. and We went to Wisconsin and made some records. I, you did? He said, yeah, for the Paramount label. You recorded for Paramount? He said, yeah, I was going to the Paramount lady. And we talked for a while, and his wife was getting very uneasy. And he introduced me to his wife, Annie, you know, and so forth. And, and anyways, this led to me contacting Piedmont Records up in uh, Virginia. They had found John Hurt, but they had just found Reverend Robert Wilkins. Bracey said, I'll record again, but only gospel songs. He wanted $500. And that was a lot of money in 1963. He took my guitar, I loaned him, bad mistake, I never got it back. I loaned him a $75 K resonator guitar I bought because I couldn't find a dobro in those days to practice on. He let me make two verses of two songs. One was Calvary, Lord Calvary, sure he died for you and me. We put it on a tape and sent it to uh, the record company up in uh, Virginia and they turned it down. So we got Reverend Robert Wilkins who's going to sing all the songs. But... I said, how'd you get on record? Reverend Bracey. Oh, Mr. Spear. I said, who? Mr. Spear. I said, who was he? He said, well, he ran a music store on Ferris Street. Oh, he did? Yeah. And I said, okay, well, listen, is he still alive? I said, yeah, last time I heard him, he was selling real estate. I looked in the phone book again. You know, like a good detective does, I looked in the phone book, and there said, it's been Bracey. I looked in the phone book, H.C. Spear, Pearl, Mississippi. ding a -ling. Mr. Spear, my name is Ward Lowe. Are you the Mr. Spear you stole in the music store? Sure did. I said, wow. I said, did you get people on record? He said, well, yeah, I, I got a few people on record. Can I come out and see you tomorrow? He said, well, yeah, you come on out. Go out to see him. He's living in a two-room, small house in Pearl, Mississippi, near the airport. But the thing he's most proud of is he had the most beautiful, organic garden out behind his house. He grew tomatoes that size. He grew everything, corn. He won awards for having the best uh, garden over in Rankin County. 
but he'd fallen on hard times in his later life. He was 60, probably, he was born in 1897, so in 63, he was probably 66 years old, living in a two-room house. He had lived very well in the 1920s, you know, when he had that music story. And he told me all about it. He said, I said, what about Charlie Patton? Oh, yeah, old Charlie. I said, I found him. He said, he was the very best I ever found, best child I ever found. And I asked him about, you know, Tommy. He said, yeah, old Tommy, he had a hard time staying sober. And he told me stories about Tommy. He said, yeah, I, he told me the companies he scouted for, you know. I, I just awestruck, you know, awestruck. And Did he mention what got him started in it? Yeah, it was business. In other words, he was running the music store, and the record companies let him know. Just selling records? Yeah, he was selling he, he, he opened the music store on Ferry Street in the black section of Jackson because he realized the white music store were lines uptown on Capitol Street did not want black customers. So he had worked in New Orleans when he got out of the Navy in World War One. He worked in New Orleans in the Columbia Assembly plant, making big shoulders. He came back to Jackson, decided he wanted to go in business for himself. He looked around and saw that he had a business to sell to blacks. So he opens a music store on Ferry Street and 90% of his customers were black. So he started stocking anywhere from six to 800 records in his music store. And he had a little listening booth where you come in, you take three or four records, go in and listen, yeah. and you come out and buy them for 75 cents a piece. And he said on a Saturday he might sell as many as three or four hundred records or more on a good Saturday. Because wow. those days there's no TV, there were no radios, so black people bought records. I mean, they were just getting a portable record player that they could take home. Well, they had, they had wind-up controllers. See, like the one I got over here, that's a really expensive yeah. controller. That's a, that was a $600 controller in 1929. But you could buy a little portable suitcase model, or you could buy, you know, stand-up models. And the black women who worked for white people as cooks or domestic service, they were the ones who had enough money. They'd come buy records on the second. Did uh, Spears have a studio? He had a little... Upstairs at 225 North Ferris, he bought a recording machine where he could do tests because he realized the record companies wanted tests in a lot of cases. He actually did a test of Tommy Johnson and Ishmael Bracey and sent it to Ralph Peer at RCA Victor. And these were just like record discs? It was a 10 inch disc that you recorded on aluminum. And he sent those to Peer in uh, probably New York. Because Victor had the headquarters in Camden, New Jersey, they recorded. Peer was the A&R man that recorded Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. And he was traveling down through the south. And so he sends him up, and for about two or three months, he didn't hear anything. And suddenly he gets a telegram, he says, have the, your artist in Memphis on such and such date to record. So he had found Bracey on a Saturday afternoon. I asked Bracey. He had found Bracey on a Saturday afternoon, singing up there on the corner. And Bracey said he was slightly hung over and he was singing a song about got four or five puppies, one with a shaggy hound. And he said this white man walked up to me in a coat and tie. He said, I thought he was the law, a detective. And he listened to me for a couple of minutes. And he said, oh, I think I'm going to get busted. And uh, he said, hey, I kind of like your song. Uh, I'm Mr. H.C. Spirit. Why don't you go on down to my music store? So he took Brace down to the music store and he said, how many songs you got? And Brace was saying a number of songs. He said, I think you're good enough maybe to make records. And so he said, who else do you know at sing? He said, well, Tommy, Tommy Johnson. So Spirit went up on the Pearl River where Tommy Johnson was standing at a fish camp and auditioned Tommy. And Tommy had one song he said at that time. He said, now you got to have more songs. He said, the company won't yeah, record you unless you've got four songs so you better write some more songs. You know what song it is, right? I don't. I don't know what he had. Probably Big Road Blues would be my guess. And he said he had portions of other songs, but he, he told me he had to get four good songs. In other words, to be able to record. Right. So, anyways, uh, he sent Bracy and uh, Tommy Johnson and a woman singer who came in there from Hazelhurst called Rosie Mae Moore to Memphis to record. But he had sent talent earlier in 1927 over to Jeanette Studios in Birmingham one time. He worked with them one time. But he told me he had worked, he worked with Paramount, Jeanette, OK, Vocay, uh, Columbia. He sent uh, the Jackson Blue Boys to Columbia down in uh, New Orleans one time. That was Bo Carter, Charlie McCoy, and Walter Vincent. He had Bo Chapman, recording to Bo Chapman's name. He said, I put him under a different name as Bo Carter. 
who became known as the dirtiest man on record, Bo Carter. But he had all those artists, in other words, like he went to the Delta, he said he got a letter written by somebody else from Charlie Patton, and he went to Doctor's Plantation to listen to Charlie Patton. He said, first thing he realized, he said, Charlie had a lot of songs. I knew he was worth recording. I heard him because he had so many songs. And you went to Doctor. Did you go to yeah. Doctor before you met Spears or after? No.